Welcome back to the It's Just Sport podcast, A League of Her Own. I'm Joanna Reardon. I'm Eve Tallon, and today we have Sarah MacDonald with us. Sarah, tell us a little bit about you uh, for our Irish listeners. So I'm a British 800-1500 metre runner. I live in Birmingham, across in England at the moment, so... <laughs> Really? How long have you been um, involved in like running? Like what's been your starting point? You know, I remember like I read about, well, not in a stalker way, I read about you, but um, <laughs> like we were doing some research and, you know, you were like an ice skater, or, you know, you're a medicine student or studied medicine. Like what brought you into to running all of a sudden? Yeah, so I am, um, I was an ice skater back in school and had a pretty bad injury and I needed surgery on both my hips and after that, I think ice skating was probably a no-go for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to start running just to get a bit of fitness back um, when I was in sixth form. And it just kind of started off like I just run around the block at home and then that became two times around the block. And I ended up going to my local running club just because I enjoyed it and I wanted to run with people. Um, and when I went to university, I went to Birmingham to study medicine and I had no, no idea what that would end up as I kind of went thinking I'd just be a sociable runner and use it to, as an outlet for medicine and I met Bud Baldaro there and there was a really good training group at the time Hannah England was like it was the year that she'd won the world silver medal and it kind of just sucked me in and it went from there really <laughs> I think ice skating is such a, a cool sport to be involved in, but we have obviously all seen some some falls and that type of thing. But um, yeah, what was it like, you know, transitioning from ice skating into athletics? Yeah, it was a very different sport. I always remember like ice skating was very much an individual sport too, but it was more of an artistic sport. Yes, there was the technical mm -hmm. element to it, but I I did find the artistic side hard. Um, so I was actually quite glad to go to a sport where it didn't matter if my fingers were pointing in the right direction at times and stuff like that. <laughs> and yeah, I just liked running because it was like testing my body to see how far and how quick I could take it. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it was, I came into athletics very late compared to most people, but I almost feel that's favoured me in the fact that I have had a longer career from there and I saw a lot of people in uni drop out and not enjoy it as much but I actually like really enjoyed like doing all the races they'd done as like kids just as a bit older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are like some of the random skills that have like crossed over from ice skating into like running like is like I had like a like a friend who was a ballet like she was a ballet like person I don't know why is it person she was a dancer and her posture <laughs> was like incredibly straight and whenever she ran like she just looked really like weird and flimsy it was just like the weirdest thing I've ever like seen in my life like what like for you has been like the bonus of having ice skating in, in your background as well? Oh, I'm not sure there are many bonuses. I can do a really good pistol squat because it's how I used to spin out. <laughs> <fighting. laughs> but I'm not really sure there's actually been too much of a crossover, um, unfortunately for me. <laughs> I just had an image oh, yeah. of you being like dead straight, like running, you know, like back, like Michael like Johnson style, like proper, like upright. <laughs> I wish it was, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd say, look, obviously, I'm... Um, you know that athletic base and, and skill uh you know transfers into into the running now but you've had such a, a successful career so far so talk to us a little bit about the highlights that you've had uh, it's you know you, you talk about coming into it late but you have had a, a very impressive career yeah i would say there's probably like a few major highlights for me and one of those like although it wasn't my best performance but like 2017 the world championships in london i'm sure even as an irish athlete that was like incredible um that the support in that stadium and being able to run in the olympic stadium was so good and knowing all my friends and family were there like it was a great first like major champs experience i've been to the europeans twice before but nothing will ever match up to that um it was also like a few other races that have been really enjoyable like the mixed relays at euro cross are always mm -hmm. really fun and are always really well supported and both times I've done it with one, which is always a nice bonus to add to it. But um, yeah, they've been really fun and a bit different. And like, yeah, um, obviously, like I've ran four minutes and 159, but it was just the experience of going to champs and like being around people and being able to travel with like all your friends and stuff and train mm -hmm. in all these cool places has been 
it's something that I never anticipated I'd ever be able to do so it would like probably, <laughs> like we all kind of hear like you know people talk about like race and championship experience and kind of different things like that like what for you was like what you needed in terms of race experience like what did you learn from like going to worlds and like doing all the cool things you've done I guess like leading up to that I had I hadn't really raced the circuit a great deal, but in Britain, we always have a BMC and like, yeah, that's great as a time trial. And even like the Diamond Leagues are good as like a time trial, but going to champs and like learning to deal with heats and the pressure of heats, I find it really like nerve wracking, especially when you know that you'll have to bring your A game the next day, Mm -hmm. being able to conserve a bit at the same time as qualifying and not underplaying a heat is really difficult. Yeah, like mentally, like how is that like a thing? Like how do you conserve, like despite kind of being trained to like give it your all, like in every single race? Like how, like how mentally tiring is that? Um, to be honest, like all the champs I've been to, I've kind of just had to treat each round like a final. Otherwise, you run the risk of not making it through. But mm-hmm. I do struggle with sleeping that night and like making sure I've slept enough and recovered enough and not think about it before the next day. And that's something I've really had to work on. Mm-hmm. I think it's, um, it's it's interesting to hear that you're in the European cross country and the success that you've had. Uh, something that we love to watch, like really, really enjoy it. Um, and we have also, uh, you know, spoken to Kira McGean, who has said that it is, you know, one of the most difficult races that she's ever done in that time thing. So how do you find coming off the track and, and getting stuck in the muck and, you know, really giving 100% there? <laughs> I do remember in Lisbon, um, I, so I did the relay, which is only 1,500 metres long, but Kira ran the full race, and I was like, I yeah. have no idea how you did that loop like <laughs> four or five times. It was awful. Like, I cannot describe how bad that course was. It was just like up, down, <laughs> up, down. So, I, yeah, I, I'm in awe of the girls that can manage to do multiple laps, and I'm pretty glad it's just one lap. And it can be quite forgiving. <laughs> yeah, no, she's because um, look, we've seen other people, uh, other middle distance runners in the relay as well. So um, Nadia Power and Amy O'Donoghue have competed um, in the mixed relay for Ireland before and would come from middle distance. But Kira has stepped up to to try the full thing, and uh, she, yeah, she definitely talks about how how difficult um, it is. In relation to um, your your goals for the future, what is what have you got your sights set on at the moment? Obviously, like this year, I'm just trying to get my way back to fitness. I had a bit of a injury struck last, like 2020. So just trying to get back to what I do best and like racing and getting back on the circuit. And hopefully I've got the qualification standard for Tokyo. It's just a case of getting mm-hmm. ready for trials and seeing what happens there. But obviously 2022 is a very, very busy year. So we've got the commies, we've got Euros, we've got Worlds. So there's so many things next year to like set sights on and like make some goals towards. Mm-hmm. Was it like a bit weird, like, you know, having everything kind of postponed for like an extra year? Like what it must have been kind of a bit more of a relief for you, you know, as you said, if you were kind of struck down for 2020, you know, you were probably like, yes, thank God, they moved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did think that at the time, like I was really struggling with that toe in the lead up to the Olympics and when it got cancelled it was almost like a relief which is kind of weird to think now but it is weird like how much is now in 2022 and Mm -hmm. there's still uncertainty over this year too which is quite Mm -hmm. difficult to deal with but you just have to make sure you're in the best shape possible and have to go on like it's happening until further notice really how Mm -hmm. like frustrating is it you know that having as you said like a toe injury like how mentally annoying is that you know like something so small could put you off like so much you know because I think for non-runners I'm non-runner um it like looking on it must be like what like a a toe (laughs) well there's Inga one of the Inga Britons has a has a toe problem as well (laughs) yeah I am I don't know how it ever happened but I have bunions on both my feet and one of them just gets so angry. <laughs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> and there's not much I can do about it. But I have worked and like got orthotics now and try and do everything for my poor little big toe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is quite annoying. And if people ever ask you like, oh, it's just a toe. But yeah, it, I use it every step. So yeah. mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about uh, training during lockdown and kind of managing that as um, you know things have been a bit different. Yeah, well, obviously this recent lockdown was a lot different to last 
March, a year ago now. Um, Because at first we could only go out once a day, we couldn't travel, gyms weren't open, the track wasn't open. But this time I've actually been quite fortunate that I can still travel to Loughborough and use the gym and track there as and when I need it. But it has been really tough not being able to see my coach and Mm -hmm. not being able to train with other people. It's just been quite mentally exhausting. And I know that everyone's doing it and everyone's having to cope. And it's just about coping until restrictions ease, which actually does happen next week. So fingers crossed. (laughs) (laughs) What have been your like coping methods, like apart from like running, like how have you been surviving lockdown? Like I have a friend in in Bradford and yeah, no, she was like, oh, like the sooner I can mix outdoors, the better. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the dog does help a lot. (laughs) Let's just say like she has been a lifeline the last year. So being able to take her for a walk and having that bit of company. My um, partner works in a school, so he's been at work most of the time. So it has been quite lonely and she has provided a lot of um, entertainment, but also annoyance. (laughs) Dogs are great, man. Like dogs are great. Like we had, like Nima was last week, like we had three dogs when we started lockdown last year. Like two were very old. So they obviously like passed on, but we have one left. And like without her, like I would not know what I do like without the dog. Like she's just, she's, she's literally my life and soul. Like I'm not even being dramatic about it. (laughs) Um, I know we obviously reached out in relation to the incident that happened on the canal. So um, thanks a million for, you know, agreeing to talk to us about it. And we just want to help you kind of get the message as as far and wide um, as possible. So, you know, you've obviously been training kind of on the canal uh, during lockdown. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what happened that day? Yeah, so it was a few weeks back now and it was... um... I had a session on the canal, some 800 reps, which is my favourite thing too at the best of times. But I was warming up um, and Scott was on the bike behind me um, and he shouted for me to move over because there's a bike coming. And two guys on the mopeds came past me but slowed down. And the one on the back of the bike grabbed my bum and were like shouting things at me too. And... I, I just like kind of stopped on the spot as they like rode away and like looked at Scott like did you just see that like and we were both like shouting things and it it was horrible and, and like we kind of just didn't know what to do like Scott was like should I go after them and I was like well what what could you possibly do mm. and yeah we kind of just had to be like right we've come here to a session like let's just get on with the session because what what else can we do now and it wasn't until I got home and sat down and I was like did that actually really just happen Mm -hmm. I've obviously had as a female runner you get people shouting things and that just becomes part and parcel of being a runner but no one's ever touched me like that before and it just kind of left me feeling really like I, I can't even describe it really but yeah it did make me reflect on where I was running, who I was going to run with and what I was going to do going forward. Like I have rethought my roots and Mm -hmm. I don't use that stretch of canal anymore. And I do try and run with people more than I was previously. And if I am running with headphones, I'll make sure I've just got one headphone in. And I'm not one to run in shorts a lot of the time anyway, but I do run in leggings and I don't know what more I can do really. Like Mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's one of those things I suppose that really, it shouldn't be up to you to do those things, you know, like I, like I come, I, like I, in college, like I studied like criminology, like, and all this kind of stuff, like, and all the time, whenever, like, it's an invasion of personal privacy or anything like that, it's always like the victim that gets, has to change their, like, motives, like, how frustrating is that for you? Like, I'm not saying maybe you loved that stretch of canal that you were running on, but maybe it was nice, it was ideal, it might have been close to your house, like, how annoying is that? Yeah, it it was quite annoying, but more because, we're in this lockdown at the moment that the parks are so busy. Like I live next to a massive mm. park, Sutton Park, but it's just like, there's too many people there. And I feel like I'm in people's space and people get a bit anxious if you run past them too close. And I use that stretch because it's so quiet and there's not many people mm-hmm. there and I can kind of get what I need done on the flat surface. It's like my track. Um, so yeah, that, that has been difficult to rethink what I'm going to do and, I have now been using an industrial estate, which is not ideal as well, but it's better than the alternative, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we just, sometimes we trip each other up in the questions. <laughs> um, 
yeah like what does that feel like now where you know it's it's kind of been you've been you've been made feel unsafe when you're just trying to go out and train and like obviously you're you know you're competing internationally like what is it like and particularly as an international athlete like if you're experiencing that you know lots of other people are probably experiencing the same type of thing yeah the main thing I said that I obviously came out and tweeted and posted on my Mm -hmm. Instagram story about the thing but I didn't do that necessarily for myself like it wasn't like an outlet for me Mm -hmm. I just went back and forth about it and I wanted to like raise awareness for it in case other people had been through the same because I knew that other people wouldn't go out on the run running again like Mm -hmm. I have and I have to but some people wouldn't and I realized that this lockdown and the restrictions have meant that when the nights are longer and obviously it gets darker earlier that without running groups and without like club like training that a lot of runners that previously wouldn't run alone now have to and there's no other option for that and obviously I can run in daylight and the incident did happen in the daylight, but it made me really worry about people running in the dark and stuff and where they were choosing to run. And often you're led with no choice, but yeah, I just wanted to raise awareness for the, the issue and to make sure that other people didn't feel alone and it, it wasn't okay and it, it never will be okay. Mm-hmm. And like it's, it's come after, you know, everything that as well that has gone on you know, um, in England as well, you know, with the, the police officer, like, and everything in between. So, like, you know, for you, after you kind of came out, like, what was the, what was, like, the reaction? And, like, how, how did you feel, I suppose, when you when you came out? Was it not, like, a relief, but, like, was it, like, a few messaging going, oh, I had that too. Were you relieved that you weren't alone or were you angry that you weren't alone? Yeah, I never ex- expected how much people would respond and, like, how almost viral it went. And it, it really shocked me and disgusted me how many people have been through something similar or reports of like other things that had happened whilst people were running that had made them feel unsafe. And obviously the Welsh athletes had come out a few weeks prior to this saying that they hadn't felt safe training on the streets and people had been shouting abuse, et cetera, which is kind of like what led me to come out and tweet. But then after that, it's, thing after thing after thing I've seen like on Twitter or like with the police officer and stuff which has really it's it spiraled and it has made me feel more comfortable with what I've said that so many people have all also come out I think you know unfortunately you know girls and women have put up with the comments and like you're saying you know people shouting abuse and you know just inappropriate uh, commentary when people are training but you know how unexpected was it that somebody actually touched you and how different was that experience than you know some of the comments that maybe you let roll off your back before yeah it was completely different like I just never expected anyone to ever touch me and I was just kind of like in a state of shock like it it just wasn't okay and with comments you kind of back them off and like oh it's just a white van man or it's just builders at a building site like that's just what they do but then this was like a completely different level and it made me feel so uncomfortable and almost like violated so yeah it was difficult to like come to terms with Mm -hmm. yeah because like my like my friends here be like laughing at me so like for context like I was born without limbs and people always feel the need that like to run over like and give me a hug I don't even know these people and I'm like whoa you know booby space you know like let me be like it's just it's just so weird that like people just feel the need to like just touch you like for just no apparent reason like I mean like as I always just say to the girls like it's just I just don't like being touched anyways. Like if like me and Eve are friends, if Neve hugged me, I'd be just as uncomfortable. I'm just not a toucher anyways. Um, but like, it just actually blows my mind that people are like out there, as you said, like on mopeds, just like like touching people. Like I remember Sinead Burke, like she's a small person here in Ireland. Um, someone in the street leapfrogged her, like just for no apparent reason, only just to leapfrog her. So like, it's just so shameful, like everything that is going on and how people feel that it's funny to invade other people's sp- space when it's not. Yeah, I feel at the moment as well, like there's such a big thing about giving people space. Mm. And like, even if you go to a shop at the moment and there's too many people in there, you almost feel like claustrophobic. You're like, I need more space. And then actually someone touching you is like, oh, you've actually just like (laughs) gone into my bubble. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, literally, because I was only saying it to one of the girls. I was like, I hope this like non-touching COVID world like stays with me because I just love <laughs> being able to go into a shop and not have a granny like drool over me. I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, look, I think it was really great that you shared your story on, on especially like raise awareness because I think a, lo- a lot of people who kind of go out and, you know, may not consider how safe or unsafe the routes that they take are or if they're by themselves and that type of thing. And obviously um, there are lots of things that that can happen. And, you know, I know you're, you're like you were lucky that you were with somebody when, when this happened. And, and I know you said that um, kind of when you put out your, your comments that, um, you know, you were grateful that somebody was with you when it happened. Yeah, no, I'm like really grateful that I had someone with me, but it just worries me as to what would have happened if I was on my own at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what even blows my mind, like the fact that you were with someone and it still happened. Because I always mm-hmm. like think, like, oh, if I hang out with six foot lads, they could be like my fake bodyguards, but like it still like mightn't necessarily work. Now the lads I hang out with are total like I mean they wouldn't fight anyone for me, so I'm I need to rethink my group strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what it's like. Obviously, now look, you're back. You're back running. You're you're rethinking your um. You're you're, you're rethinking your strategy essentially, and you're just kind of a lot a lot more aware. So tell us what it's been like getting back to it, and um, you know, kind of advice that you would give other athletes that are out there. But obviously, I just had to kind of rethink what I'm doing, and just for my own like peace of mind at the moment, I'm running with my phone, and I have the app on my iPhone that's like find friends and like my mum, dad, partner and a few people have me on that and at the moment I tend to tell someone when I'm leaving for a run when to expect me back and when Mm -hmm. to expect me back plus a bit of walking time (laughs) in case I'm a bit later and yeah I just try and make sure I go on routes that I feel comfortable on and when I can I do run with people and Mm -hmm. it's really it's really difficult to know what else to do like I always run in leggings I'm never one to wear less than the weather, if you know what I mean. I, I don't run around in shorts and a crop top when it's it's cold. It's really tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you shouldn't, like, look, even even like you're talking about the clothing that you're using, and, and that actually shouldn't come into it at all. Um, you are obviously a great role model for young girls in sports. So what um, was it like for you growing up um, as, as a young girl in relation to kind of role models and that that you had? Um, so obviously I came into the sport late and it was probably university time that I really got going and obviously I had the advantage that Hannah was there and I kind of looked up to her and I, I took tips off her really. I saw the way she trained and I saw that she would never cut a warm up or a cool down short and she was so disciplined and I learned a lot by training with her and going on the old camp with her and I've, I've learned a lot from being in that environment with Sarah Tracy as well, Irish People chase runner, um, mm-hmm. Alice and Leonard, they were all really great to, to look up to. And more recently, I've had the pleasure of training with Lindsay Sharp, and she's great at like discipline and like how to present herself, and Rosie too. So I had so many like great women around me to like learn off and bounce off. Mm-hmm. That's brilliant. It sounds like there's such a, a, a strong team there and, and people that you're surrounded by. And when you were younger and when you were ice skating, did you look up to people within ice skating or outside of ice skating? Or, um, that was just something that you just loved doing and you just got stuck in. Um, I just loved doing it. And I got stuck in really. But you do look up to other people around you training and seeing what they're doing and how they present themselves. And yeah, you do like get things from other people from being around them really. I guess it's the same wherever you are. If you saw someone at school be like Mm -hmm. really good at getting good grades, but they always did certain things, you try them just to see if it worked for you too. Like Mm -hmm. as someone who has like overcome injury and probably like setbacks and kind of so many different things, like how, like what kind of mental like tips and advice would you give to like young girls or anyone who's aspiring to be a runner or maybe people who are like multi-sport discipline, like what would be your, your main advice? I think you just, however bad things get, you do have to try and stay positive. And I'm probably one for, I try and see the funny side in things because that's just my coping mechanism. Yeah. And yeah, like you just have to focus on the long, the bigger picture. And often you're injured and like you can't run for that week, but you ran for the other 51 weeks of the year. And like, I try and look at training like the yellow pages in one day or one session is just one page of a big book. 
And I actually think sometimes we don't give enough ourselves enough slack. And sometimes it's important to look back and look at everything you have done rather than focusing on what you haven't done. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really interesting way to, to look at it. And definitely, I think something that people will, will, um, you know, take into their life as a, as a good way. Um, what was I going to ask there? Um, oh yeah. So, so what is it like, um, in the UK in relation to, uh, women's sport and what kind of support and, and that you have there is, is there still work being done on, you know, promoting equality for women in sport? Yeah, I think there's currently a lot of work being done, especially through British athletics now to increase the quality, but, I know there's the big cross-country debate going on in Britain at the moment and stuff like that. So we'll see how it pans out with the new restructure within like British athletics and see what England athletics come out with. I've just been involved in the preparation for the launch of women's safety running. So I'm sure that'll be out soon, if not before this comes out. So <laughs> look out for that. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I think there's a, a lot of work being done internationally and it's great to see that, um, you know, different countries and different organisations are, are putting in the, the effort to get as much coverage to female athletes as possible and try and create sponsorship opportunities and that type of thing. I think from, a, from an Irish perspective, um, you know, sometimes people would look at the, the UK setup and, uh, you know, see that, there's, that the kind of investment in sport um, might be a bit more than, than here, which is something that I guess is really good for development of athletes. Uh, yeah, I always see Ireland like you support like the Irish athletics people support their athletes so well that I guess within Britain there's so many athletes that they mm -hmm. kind of have a, a program and you see that program from outside so it's really difficult to compare them I guess like there's pros and cons to both but yeah we do get like really good opportunities through what we do and they are very supportive but I guess you just mm -hmm. have a different way of looking at it from island <laughs> yeah no it is yeah. it is really interesting like the way you phrased it like you know because i suppose for us like i don't know i suppose like we're always told like more participation means more money whereas like for you you have more participation but maybe the money is spread a bit thinner because there is so many people obviously competing um all the time so yeah i know that is obviously an incredibly um interesting way to kind of to kind of look at it mm. i suppose like from your own perspective and kind of everything you've done like have you noticed um an uptake in women's like athletics like from that point of view i suppose athletics is a one of the niche sports that's like highlighted alongside the men's you know as well you know they're not like two separate entities at all so like for you have you noticed an increase in in young girls and, and women taking up um running and different things um i don't really have too much involvement within like develop the development side of athletics like i'm based at the elite center and you don't yeah. really see that but from what I've heard, like the numbers are up as well. And hopefully because I live in Birmingham, like the lead up to the Commonwealth Games, that'll help boost like sport, especially like in the younger ages and generations seeing that in within the city. So fingers crossed that that, that boosts it, having a home games again. Brilliant. You know, I think um, we talked about some really interesting and, and important things. Uh, and unless Joanne has any more burning questions, I... <laughs> No, definitely not on my end. No, just uh, really appreciate you participating and sharing your story. I know how incredibly hard these things can be. So no, we really do appreciate um, mm -hmm. you coming on and giving up your time as well, especially with training and, and coming back and different things. So no, Niamh, it's over to you to close, I think. Yeah. No, thanks so much, Sarah, for uh, you know, taking the time to chat to us, obviously, about what happened. And I think it's uh, really important that you have done so. And you know, you'll definitely um, encourage other girls to be safe and more aware of what's going on. And we're sorry that happened to you in the first place, um, but thanks so much for, for, you know, standing out and talking about it. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. And yeah, hopefully we'll talk again soon.